Fantastic. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm uh, <laughs> in touch right now with our next, next speaker, um, Paloma Zapata, and uh, very, very excited to have Paloma joining us here um, all the way from Barcelona. And uh, she is the CEO of Sustainable Travel International. Um, so what I'm going to do, she's going to be hopping on here in just a minute. Um, and I think what I'll do is, is just go ahead and wait um, for, for her to arrive to give her the baton, of course. But let's get started. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and read for everyone on board here with us. Uh, the, bio, the bio for Paloma Zapata. Uh, as CEO, Paloma leads uh, the global efforts of Sustainable Travel International to maximize tourism's contribution to conservation and development in order to protect destinations, preserve natural environments, and improve community well being. With over 15 years of experience in sustainable tourism and economic development, Paloma has designed and implemented impactful initiatives and projects in 25 countries across the globe. Her work has ranged from addressing the shortcomings of the current tourism supply to deriving sustainable development strategies and formulating policies. Some of her achievements include contributing to the creation of sustainable tourism master plans for Belize, Bermuda, Colombia, and Panama, as well as developing a plan to link disenfranchised communities in Cambodia's Siam re region to the tourism value chain. Paloma joined Sustainable Travel International in 2015 and previously served as vice president Prior to joining Sustainable Travel International, she served as a senior consultant for tourism and leisure consulting, leading numerous transformative tourism development projects around the world. Uh, I, I definitely want to mention then, of course, this final line, which is that earlier in her career, this might come as a surprise to many of us, um, she worked for IBM's microelectronics division as staff industrial engineer and registered three patents. That's not a line that I, <laughs> I get to share very often with anyone. So um, really fun to share that with all of you. Um, Paloma holds a master's degree in uh, business administration and a postgraduate uh, degree in tourism management uh, from Esade Business School in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, she's a native speaker of Spanish and English. And um, yes, that is her background. And so very, very excited to have um, Paloma here with us. And um, I believe she'll be joining us shortly. Yes, per look at that, perfect timing. <laughs> so I think this is actually perfect timing, having uh, Paloma joining us here. Uh, a warm welcome to you, Paloma. I consider Paloma a close friend. Um, we met actually, believe it or not, at the first 2016 Tourism Naturally Conference in person in Sardinia, Italy which was uh, fantastic. So now in our fifth Tourism Naturally Conference, Paloma, great to see you again. Great to have you back with us. And uh, just for the sake of time, we have about 25 minutes left of this session. Um, and I'm sure people will have some questions at the end. We'll see how many of those we can get to. So Paloma, I already read your biography. It's great to have you here with us and uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure um, to work with you, David. And yes, we met in Sardinia. I can't believe it's been such a long time or even it was the first one, but it was it was a great opportunity um, to be in the first uh, Tourism Naturally conference. And I am happy to be here um, again with you guys. Apologies if I was a little bit late. I had some technical difficulties, but I'm here now. So um, yeah, so David did a great job of introducing my background. And I also want to introduce who Sustainable Travel International is. So we are a mission-driven organization, and we believe the tourism done well can be a means of economic development and conservation. But tourism done incorrectly can be devastating for those same you know, issues. It can create economic leakages. It can um, devastate environments. Um, it can alienate communities. 
um, and many other, you know, different, you know, effects, um, again, on, on the destination itself. But if done correctly, it can be a means of conservation. It, to channel, you know, tourism um, funds towards conservation, it could be a means of economic development, it could be a means of a celebrating, you know, local cultures. Um, so, and of course, of economic development of, of a destination. So that is the nexus where we work in. And the way we do this is we support um, governments um, or destination managers on their journey towards sustainability. We support responsible businesses as well to be able to operationalize sustainability in their, um, in their businesses. We also um, generate awareness for the tourists themselves um, to be able to also to take action um, and to implement uh, sustainability. And as well as with local communities, we're trying to empower them in reaping the benefits of tourism. So it is a very big mandate um, that we do have, um, and we, you know, we aim to do this, you know, one day at a time, and really to create um, a change that creates a ripple effect in the tourism industry. Um, and, and create change across the board. So um, with that said, what I wanted to talk to you, you know, today is about um, it, my experience in developing caring capacity studies, specifically for vulnerable destinations, um, vulnerable ecosystems, in this case, island nations. I've had the privilege to um, um, develop and to is a couple of studies or different studies in different uh, island nations, such as the island of Aruba, in the island of the Seychelles, as well as currently working on the carrying capacity study of the island of Bonaire. So uh, these, you know, these particular islands are very unique um, when it comes to their environmental ecosystems, as well as um, having experienced a boom and a growth when it comes to their tourism arrivals. But with that growth, you know, not only comes, you know, economic, you know, development, positive economic development, but also comes other issues, other impacts that the destination may not be ready to be able to manage those particular impacts. And there are a few impacts that are very much felt across the board in these island nations. Um, and why? Because they, of course, have limited space. They're very small islands. Again, they have, you know, fragile and unique ecosystems. Um, and they may not be, you know, they may not have their infrastructure um, ready to be able to, um, to cater to an increased amount of uh, tourism arrivals in their destinations. So the boom in tourism in a very short amount of time has had those detrimental effects on you know the socio you know, social cultural environment, so you know affecting um, the communities in itself, um, on the physical infrastructure, as well as on the ecosystems. The island of Bonaire um, is actually even more unique than these two islands because not only have they experienced a growth in tourism arrivals, but they have experienced a growth in residents. Um, a very much an increase in, in, in a boom in residents, you know, um, and it is interesting to say that even post um, COVID, they have increasingly uh, received um, an amount of a tourism, a, or I'm sorry, of residential a, um, of new an influx of new residents, you know, moving into this um, amazing environment, you know, after you know having lived, you know, COVID, but that in itself. Um, has again, you know, an effect on the environment and the society. So um, what I wanted to, you know, bring to you is um, the approach that we use um, and explain to you um, what is, you know, what, why this approach um, can be very effective in understanding the caring capacity of the destination, as well as a, as a framework that can support destinations in growing in a sustainable manner. And of course, to share as well that, you know, the same issues can be very much experienced um, in these particular um, vulnerable destinations, again, particularly island nations. So our approach, um, you know, has, you know, a couple of different phases. And one is to gather um, input 
from a, you know, desktop research. So we would understand um, what are the different planning tools, what are the different growth patterns that are happening in the destinations, where have been, you know, the investments have been gone. And all of this is being led by a carrying capacity framework that we've developed. This carrying capacity framework is very much touching upon the different indicators, the different uh, most important indicators of a destination, specific, specifically an island destination, that they should be um, looking at and um, that are going to be impacted um, by any particular growth. So this a carrying capacity indicator, we look at you know, different areas, such as the socioeconomic indicators. And those indicators we'll be looking at um, such as you know, access to jobs, um, access to a education, and how access to health, um, as well as other cultural um, components, um, such as the preservation of cultural heritage, it could be language, could be oral heritage, traditions, etc. We look at um, a other um, socioeconomic indicators, um, such as the GDP growth, the Gini coefficient, um, a, we look at, you know, for example, the growth in access to affordable housing, um, the, in different, different types of indicators when it comes to the socioeconomic component. We look at um, the physical infrastructure. Also, you know, very important to understand um, when it comes to the, uh, the, the uh, systems and when it comes to the water, access to clean water, access to potable water in general, Island nations, you know, can have, you know, difficulty in accessing, you know, water, um, clean water, um, as well as, you know, potentially having to create solutions such as desalination solutions, which have in another, an, another component that it brings in, such as um, a, the need for additional energy, um, as well as, you know, more investment into be able to access clean water. A connections to sewage systems as well. You know, you find again in that in developing nations specifically, they may not have, you know, 100% connection to a sewage system, which then again has a detrimental effect on the environment if there are leakages um, to, um, to the soil. We look at the energy production. How is the energy being generated? Um, renewable versus non-renewable sources, and is the capacity of the island being able to withstand, you know, that additional growth in residents and in um, the tourism and um, in tourism infrastructure development. We look at. Um, the uh, waste collection, um, as well, how much recycling is in the island. A lot of these islands, you know, don't do not have a uh, recycling facilities, and may, they may rely on landfills, which in itself, in a small island, can also have a detrimental effect on the communities, on the environment, um, and can create leakages to um, to the ocean as well as to to the soil. Again, having um, health uh, directly linking to you know health issues in the communities. So we look at road uh, networks as well. A lot of these islands have also very small roads. They may not necessarily, you know, have be, be paved, for example. So when you have a lot of impact in um, an additional residence, more cars on the islands, um, more cruise arrivals that will require a lot more buses on the islands and could create additional hazards on the road, as well as some, you know, um, nuisance because, of course, it will create more traffic and then um, the local residents will have, you know, um, worse time getting, you know, to where they need to go. So these are the types of indicators that we look at when it comes to the ecological uh, infrastructure, or I'm sorry, the ecological impact. Again, we look at, you know, the particulars of that um, a destination, but particularly in island nations, um, you look at a urban versus natural lands. Um, so what percentage do you have protected areas? What percentage of protected areas do you have marine protected areas? Um, are there depletion of um, certain species? in the destinations, you know, could be um, uh, um, a endemic species that could be uh, also at risk, could be flamingos from flamingos um, to a shark biomass to turtle nesting is also it's super important in these destinations. You may also see that there's been a lot of a degradation of beaches and beach erosion because 
Um, there is, you know, building constructions right in front of the beach, which erodes the beaches. There has also been um, a lot of a destruction of mangroves um, and seagrass, you know, for the benefit of creating um, beaches that are swimmable by the by the tourists. But that, of course, in, has an effect on the environment, on the ecosystem, which down the line even can create um, less, you know, fish in the ocean and less fish to. Um, you know, can create a, a food security issue. So without going, you know, through like a very long list, we have over 100 indicators that we look at. These are the main things that we will be looking at and identifying, first of all, current conditions and what are those trends that lead you to there. So we will look at, you know, the last 10 years. So for example, you know, how many turtle nests were there, you know, back in 2010 versus, you know, nowadays, and has there been a decline? Um, and then uh, we do we do also interview interview stakeholders on the ground. So the local um, stakeholders that are no more knowledgeable in these areas. So we're talking about from a environmentalist a, to you know the local authorities to statisticians um, to those working you know with communities. We across the board with with culture, you know, museums to in you know um, a asset managers, etc. So we do an in depth um, interviews with um, these different stakeholders to be able to identify um, the current conditions of these different indicators, um, as well as to determine what those ideal conditions are. And of course, in between, we find what the thresholds are. This particular framework is, uh, is a very important component of this approach because it not only looks at you know, the snapshot of a, where we are today, and we use a stoplight chart to indicate where those um, a, indicators uh, may be already at risk you know, or in decline, um, but is also a framework that can be used to further engage, you know, um, with the development of the island nation to understand, you know, if they are reaching a tipping point and to be able to take um, a mitigating steps um, to, to take hold of, of those particular indicators. So that snapshot, that, you know, that indicator uh, framework is important to see where they currently are, but it also is a tool to, you know, obviously continuously monitoring and, um, and, and measuring and uh, mitigating those particular areas that have been considered at risk or that could become at risk, you know, later on in the future. Another important component of the uh, of this work is the resident sentiment. So we've um, an, we, part of our approach is to understand what the, how the residents' lives has been impacted with this growth. So we do that with a resident survey. So it's a comprehensive resident survey. Of course, you need to gauge you know how they're feeling, what are the different areas that are affecting their lives, you know, and what they consider is the most important area that needs to be um, a, looked at and a, a being able to address um, because, you know, it may not be balanced, you know, at the moment. So super important to get the resident survey um, and get the resident sentiment in. Another important component is the um, a tourist experience as well. So we call that, you know, an experiential experiential survey. The experiential survey, um, you know, tends to be more uh, geared towards crowdiness. So how is the how are they perceiving crowdiness in the different destinations? So it's important to understand their own perception of crowdiness in the destination. And of course, we add additional questions in there as far as what they consider to be um, a, if the destinations in the environment is, you know, is pleasing or they think they might it might be degraded and would they be returning to the destination um, if the if the ecosystem is, was um, at risk. And if they considered it, of course, at risk. So it's important to see and seek out those hot spots in the destinations. It could be beaches, it could be attractions, um, it could be you know underwater, um, it could be different areas that maybe consider hot spots that you want to engage tourists to understand what their experiences are. So those are the different inputs um, that come to a, to this carrying capacity analysis. 
Then um, once we have you know, gathered all this information, we go down um, to the ground. It's also very important to engage stakeholders on the ground in any planning tool. A, a, for any planning tool to be successful, it needs to have ownership from the local stakeholders. So it's important to engage them in this process, to validate the, um, a, the, a, the inputs uh, or, or the, what you've uncovered in, in the study, in the, in the, um, in the analytical uh, part of the study. Um, so that they can uh, validate what you've uh, what you've uncovered, as well as for them to make sure that you've heard you've heard what they had to say and that you are aware of the issues that they have. So then, you know, we can engage with them in prioritizing those issues if that's something that we need to do, and we can also engage with them in action planning. So it's important in this step to also be forward thinking. Um, to not, you know, um, have them continuously engage in just the issues, but also what can we all do to actually um, be able to mitigate, you know, the issues when it comes to sustainable growth. So um, a, in that in that regards, we do town hall meetings and that is with the residents, and we also do an expert meeting. And those are with the same, you know, um, the same folks, the same group that we've interviewed, the ones that are engaged in developing that framework, we engage them in a more in-depth um, data analysis of what we've uncovered, as well as, you know, um, next steps, action planning. Again, with the stakeholders, we also want to see what their vision for the future is, and we want to align with them. And we also want to know, you know, from, from them to think about, first of all, what they can do um, a, to reduce, you know, some of those, you know, a, some of the issues, what, their, com what can, their community can do, their community leaders can do, as well as what the government can do. It's important, again, to engage everybody in those levels and not just be, you know, the responsibility of one agent, but all the agents, you know, on, on the ground. So that is, you know, the approach that we use. We come back with that information and then we um, we finalize our study and we provide, you know, the stakeholders, usually in this case, we engage with governments um, it, with the whole entire, um, you know, uh, what we have uncovered of the, in the study when, when it comes to those, um, those, those areas um, that are most at risk and the areas that could be potentially at risk. Um, we give them the indicator framework that will be used you know, um, further down the line. And ultimately, um, what will be that action agenda? Very you know, action oriented. Again, how they can mitigate um, those particular issues. Again, all of those to reach a point of sustainable development in the island. And when, when I say sustainable development, it means an island that is equally balancing not only um, economic growth, but also the needs and the well-being of the local residents. At the same time, looking at the experience of the uh, of tourists, that also catering to a high quality experience of the of the tourists, and not forgetting, of course, the um, ecological eco the ecosystem. So the health of the ecosystem and um and of course the health of the ecosystem is going to have a direct effect on the quality of the experience of the um tourist as well as the quality of life of of the residents so again it's to balance you know the whole um caring capacity analysis and the results and the actionable products um or a, you know actionable activities that we propose are to a really um, going to be aligning those all those four interests that I, I just uh, mentioned. So um, again, these, you know, I think I've, I've exposed, you know, some of the main issues that these islands may have because they do, they are mainly across the board, but just to, to you know, to sum it up, a lot of these islands experience a um, growth you know, unchecked growth that brings a lot of economic development, but that has a direct effect and a detrimental effect on the environment, on the ecosystems. It can also have a detrimental effect on the experience of the um, of the uh, local communities by alienating them, um, as well as you know, not allowing them to have access to essential uh, services, and of course, again, depleting the environment um, uh, for 
the um, for growth, but again, which can again have um, detrimental effects all the way to food security. So, David, I see you're back on. You're back on. So I think we have some time um, to be able to take maybe some questions. Um, uh, um, yeah. Paloma, yes, thank you so much for your thoughts and sharing with us. What I really appreciate about your presentation is the level of detail, kind of walking through the process of what, uh, for example, like a carrying capacity analysis looks like in those different inputs. Um, and then of course, bringing it back around with the really strong grounding and like the local stakeholders, let's say, and, and, and uh, bringing together the multiple groups for these action plans based on that analysis. Um, can I just ask one question to start, which is, do you have kind of a, a proposed process, like that list that describes those inputs um, somewhere on your website that people, our listeners or viewers can actually go and look at? Or is there maybe an existing report that, that you might direct us towards, particularly with respect to that, maybe let's say the carrying capacity process and what those inputs might be or what the overarching process looks like? Right. I mean, we do have a, um, a an approach, a methodology that you know we use, um, that we have a documentation on. When it comes to our website, what we have is more. We, I believe that we have the experience of Seychelles. So what they, what we were able to uncover, and so what were the results of that a particular a study in the Seychelles? So that's more of a case study um, that we have on on the website. Okay, great. So I'm encouraging all of our listeners to be able to go um, at least look at that. I know I've seen reports from you in the past. You've actually presented to our students here in Colorado and in China and um, mm -hmm. been a part of, um, yeah, uh, I, I've been able to see some of the things that you've done. It's uh, the level of detail in the process, the approach is, is definitely worth looking at. Um, I have one more question um, for you that is, um, you know, you've worked with so many different countries and I'm curious uh, about you know, can you just tell us briefly, how did you connect initially with the Seychelles and then your current project in Bonaire? Um, are they reaching out to Sustainable Travel International or are you kind of uh, connecting with leaders, uh, officials, stakeholders that are already working in those areas and then kind of building those relationships and eventually kind of offering your, your, your uh, expertise? How does that process work generally for, for STI? Yeah, so it's across the board, you know, it's it, it varies. Um, uh -huh. For example, it, the Seychelles and Aruba were actually RFPs that we responded to. Um, so it was a competitive, you know, request for proposal, and we put together a, a proposal and submitted it and we won. So it was a competitive proposal. In the case of Bonaire, um, that is a particularly because of my experience of working with Aruba, I was nominated and I'm already I'm a, I'm a World Bank consultant as well. Um, so I was actually since I'm already in the system, I was brought in by the World Bank to lead this team and do the carrying capacity study because of my experience. Um, but of course, in general, like we have other projects um, in another project in Barbados that I have right now, another project in St. Kitts. And those have been because of connections, because of, you know, they knowing who we are and us wanting to work together and coming up with a program that we can work together in. So that it, it really just depends on the project. And um, but there is all, all all of those ways are are viable. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, um, you know, I, I hate to say that we're really out of time here and we have uh, at least one more question. If anybody else has questions for Paloma um, and for Sustainable Travel International, please um, share those in the Whova, at, on the Whova site and uh, we can circle back around to those um, after this uh, session ends. Uh, Paloma, I have so much to talk to you about. It's great to see you. A uh, very warm welcome. Really glad you could join us and, and share your insights and experiences. Um, we have much to learn um, in terms of that ongoing, the patience, the process, right? The connections, collaborations over time. It doesn't all happen at once, um, right? It's something that, that we can all learn from a great deal. So, so thank you so much, Paloma. Great to see you. Nice to see you. Bye-bye, everyone.